fast, efficient, and affordable business grade hosting solutions, domain registration, SSL certificates, and more. We also monitor and provide website security and update services, website builds, email hosting, amongst other sensational products. If you have a question about your web page or your presence on the internet in general, no job is too big or too small. Visit our website today, or better yet, contact us at blueoceanwebhosting.com.au and leave your website issues to us. Big ones, little ones, fiddly ones, powerful ones. The ones for the car or the truck, caravan, boat, mobility scooter, solar system. In fact, for any kind of battery, go straight to Battery Central Ipswich. They'll even help you when you know what you need to power but have no idea what'll do the job. Battery Central Ipswich, 280 Brisbane Street, West Ipswich, in the Yellow Building. Expert advice, better batteries, best prices every day. That's Battery Central Ipswich. Welcome to episode 777 of the Aussie Tech Heads. I'm Jason Oakley and this is Will Topkinson. Hey, Will. Good evening, sir. It's going to be some sort of huge lucky number, 777, right? Well, it's a whole lot of S's. Yes, it certainly <laughs> is. <laughs> uh, it, um, yeah, the, the sevens are yeah, sevens are lucky and seven seven's going to be lucky here. So 777 is going to be really lucky. It's God's number. 666 is devil's number. 777 is God's number. Yeah. It was just next door on a floor up. <laughs> I was heard that song. If if uh, the devil is six, it got is seven. This honky's gone to heaven. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. I know the song that you. Man is five and the devil is six, and that yeah. must make me seven. This honky's gone to heaven. Anyway, sure, how have you been? Uh, yeah, I've been crook actually. I'm kind of glad we, um, Damn. another day. We're recording this on a Thursday, on a Friday, on a... Usually <laughs> on a Thursday. <laughs> we're recording this on a Friday night because Thursday night things went pear shape, but I was also still not feeling great. But, uh, yeah, I had, I was just, it's, I don't know if it was what it was, but it was basically just a glorified hay fever. It was just runny eyes and runny nose, and that's... Like all it was for like a week. Constant, yeah. It was so frustrating. Like every time you'd move, things would drip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so annoying. I don't think it, uh, if it was a cold, it wasn't a very good one. It was just really. <laughs> just have a couple of tissues up there. You'll be right. Yeah, it, it just, uh, it was so frustrating. But uh, yeah, getting over that now and getting back to reality and something about spaghetti on my jumper. I don't know how that goes, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> so mum spaghetti. That's it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's been hot today. We had the coldest night we've had in just about all year, like night before last and the hottest day we've had for like three months yep. today. It's just these extremes. I, I think they're part of the reason that everybody's sick all the time. Not, not a hunt, you know. Most people aren't, aren't sick, but yep. most people aren't a hundred percent. I think it's because we're having literally one or two degree nights, and we had a twenty nine or something degree day today. Jeez, like <laughs> yeah, we got know? something like twenty five or something like that during the day, and yeah. I don't know what at night. And then three, what was it? Monday, we had um, like a three degree night. And then we had fog until like 11 o'clock and then it hit like 27 or 28 and then we had a massive storm that dumped like 5 mil in like 30 seconds. <laughs> wow. And then it was like one degree again by like four o'clock in the afternoon. It was like I've been <laughs> in Melbourne for the day. Yeah. It was ridiculous. So four seasons was, in one day. Yeah, it literally was. So... um yeah, so I've been trying to recover, but other than that, it's been relatively quiet. I put in for a new order for my phone to get a new case, and um, 
screen protector. Luckily I do have a screen protector because somehow, and I haven't figured out how, it's got a scratch right across the screen protector and a chip out of one corner. <laughs> and I've not dropped it or put it anywhere that this could happen. But just one day, a few days ago, I was just looking, I'm like, where the hell that can that's scratched over there? So put in an order on eBay for a replacement case and a tempered screen protector. Hopefully that'll help. Yeah, well, look, my Xiaomi, as you guys know, I love my Xiaomi's. Um, this is pushing three-year-old now. Time to get a new one. And I did order a new one. I ordered the new Note 12. Oh, that's not a Xiaomi, is it? The Xiaomi Note. The, basically, the difference is the Xiaomi... So it's not Samsung. The Xiaomi Note... Um, so I'm just trying to read the date on this. I'm pretty sure it's three years. The Note basically has the slightly bigger screen. It has a six point, uh, 6.4. A it's big like, man needs a big yeah, screen. Yeah, like six point the six point four rather than the five point nine or whatever the normal one is. Yep. <laughs> but um, mainly because the only reason I'm getting the new one is because the battery is getting tired. It's still fine. Um, it, it would probably still last a normal person two or three days. It's only lasting me um, a day now. Yep. Whereas it was lasting me like four days. Oh, all right. So, but. I mean, when this phone came out, like people were saying they're getting like two weeks on a battery. So oh. if it lasts me four days and now it's lasting me a day, it means it probably still would last a week for somebody <laughs> <laughs> with a light user, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, get the new one. and Get and, a new uh, Android 13's just come out on the Pixels. Yeah. Uh, pixels. Not my Pixel yet, but... So. No, you can force it apparently, but um, the reason they haven't come out yet is it's region... So they they haven't done all the language packs and everything like that. So and they do roll out, so not everybody yeah. gets at the same time. So if you do a force install before it's ready, even though you can do it, you could end up with the wrong language or the wrong anything. You know. Something, yeah. So I oh, just let it go whenever it's ready. But apparently, a lot of people <laughs> like it, and they reckon they got better battery life and faster response and all sorts of things. So. Yeah, well, it's supposed to be a lighter. Uh, the actual uh, core is is uh, a couple hundred megs smaller. Cool. So it's actually got a smaller footprint. Um, of course, every operator adds their own proprietary guff okay. to it. <laughs> um, but the actual Android experience itself is is actually smaller. Yeah. Although we discovered my phone does a cool thing that yours doesn't do. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. What's going on there? Yeah, but I only recently realised it because I've suddenly got a heap of videos and stuff on there. Before my storage meter was right down the bottom because I didn't have much on there. Yeah. But I've got about fifty percent storage in it at the moment. And I just thought it was a flat line. And I bumped my phone last night while I was looking at it. And it tilted and went, that's cool. And I flicked it back the other way and it tilted the other way. And then when you shake it, it actually does this wavy like water thing. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> just something simple and childish, but it's great. When can I get one? <laughs> Probably have to oh, download yeah. it. So I've got the new Xiaomi coming. But uh, so th what I was getting at is, yeah, you're saying yours, yours is chip. I've had the... This came with this case and screen protector. Like a, this is the factory one it come with. Yep. Um, there's a couple of bubbles in the screen, as you can see. Yep. The screen protector's got a couple of bubbles under it now after three years. Um, but I have dead set. This phone has been dropped from ladders. It's been come off the roof of cars. It's it's got really random, yeah, whatever that was, stuck to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been around a lot. It Don't just keeps to... going and going. And there's no chips or cracks or it's the durability is absolutely stupid on these things yeah um but uh yeah and it, the, it came with the screen protector in the case in the box when you buy them so oh, that's nice mine didn't <laughs> thanks google yeah um most people seem to make, like and this even the new one i've ordered comes with a screen protector and a case and a charge cable and uh, actual wall wart so oh. like <laughs> as long as it's got one of these nice silicon ones, I like them. Yeah, that's what this They're is. They're just simple and easy and they do the job. This is a silicon one. I did, on my last phone, I had one of those life case. Oh, the yeah. one you got a bolt on and blah, blah, blah. And I think I I put it on and then like three months later, I had to change the SIM card. So I took it off. And while I had it off, I spent like half an hour cleaning it because it's got so many nooks and crannies in it that went absolutely feral. Yeah. And then I realized how much work it was to take it on and put it off and I never put it back on again. <laughs> <laughs> I 
It, was, it took me like two hours. Like it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And it didn't protect the phone because I still ended up with a cracked screen. The life case didn't crack, but the screen did. <laughs> so. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, mine mine hasn't been too bad, but these these silicon cases all you really need. The new one I've got sort of a bit fancy. It's black with strappy bits like fake carbon nano type stuff design on there but they do the trick i wouldn't even bother replacing but mine's going a bit gunky as yours is collecting bits of fluff and hair in behind the case so i thought stuff it i might as well get a new case and new protector together speaking of funky and stuff have yep. you seen the look of the new android nothing phone do it it's called the nothing phone you can't just make up stuff and pretend it's real <laughs> it's um it looks amazing. It kind of looks like somebody impregnated a CD into the back of it. Like, it's a really nice design. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is cool. It's called the Nothing Phone. When you boot it on, you boot it up and it says nothing across the center of the screen. <laughs> uh, I think it's the whole thing on, you know, nothing, nothing, tra-la-la. Yeah. <laughs> it's a play on that, I think. But uh, it's receiving huge compliments and, and all sorts of stuff. Like... Um, They've got their own tweaked version of Android on it, but instead of adding stuff, they've taken stuff off it. Oh, um, yeah. It's even faster and smaller and more lightweight. And and uh, yeah, I've been reading about, it, reading about it for the last couple of days. And it's only just come out. It's only a pre-release in India and China, I think. And then um, uh, in Japan and America and Canada and stuff is like, two or three weeks away and we're supposed to be like a month away who makes it um uh it's called the nothing phone it's um a company called one plus oh yeah, yeah uh well it's from the from the the company called one plus but i think the actual company is called nothing as well i think they've changed the name but um it's got like a transparent back so you can see the battery and the all the antennas and stuff but just the way it, with the nfc reader in the center of it just looks like a cd in the center of it <laughs> middle, like a mini disc yeah and um it's only about like 450 us so it's going to be like a thousand dollars here but yep. um it's supposed to be basically competition to the pixel right um it's got uh Apparently, it's got um, issues with low light photography, which is bizarre when you see it because the entire case lights up. When you, you know, normally they, they they don't have an LED like a normal phone. It's just the back of the case ah. lights up, so the whole phone just glows when you turn your light on. <laughs> so it doesn't have like a, a flash, like a bright light. So that's why it's not super good in low light. But it does just emanate glowiness. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hardware specs wise it's it's um it's relative comparable to to you know the pix the new pixel that's coming out which is basically what it's competing against pretty much yeah um pixel it's not, out next month yeah it, i mean it's nothing super amazing it's no all gorilla grass gorilla grass <laughs> the gorilla glass stuff and um you know usb c charging and doesn't have a headphone jack um but it's got Bluetooth 5.2 and Wi-Fi 6 and an FC and 5G and all that sort of stuff. G charging? Um, yeah, 33 watt or 50, 50, 33 watt uh, wired or 15 watt wireless key charge. Also supports the 5 watt reverse charge so you can recharge your friend's phone. Yep. It's got a big 4500 milliamp battery. Um, it does, uh, you know, it, it's, it's nothing absolutely super amazing, but... Um, it's definitely an interesting, um, concept. interesting concept, and apparently it's it's quite rugged, performs well, it's relatively quick. It's got the um, the Qualcomm um, chipset in it, yep. uh, which is a, which is a bit interesting though, because the Qualcomm um, normally most of the Android-based phones, at least the international releases, get the Snapdragon. Yeah, um, the Qualcomms were. I think towards the end, the the um, Blackberries and the Nokia's and stuff were using the Qualcomm chips, um, but they've decided that it's a better chip for what they're doing. Oh, cool! 
don't even like they're using the brand new chip. It's literally just come out like it's the seven. It's the seventh generation chip, which wasn't released until May. So <laughs> they cut it pretty late to imp- incorporate a chip into a production deadline. You know, yep. um, it's a on uh, the benchmark scores. It scores very similar to the to the, uh, pixels. So nice. it should be interesting to see how it goes. Uh, you know, it's. I mean, I'm only interested in it because it's a new competitor. Like, it's an existing company that does other stuff, but it's a new competitor into the phone market mm. that's not a massive uh, Chinese company. Um, like your, your Huawei's and, and Xiaomi's and a lot of the phones that come out, they're, uh, whether they be good or bad, like 90% of them originate, they're all Chinese designed and Chinese developed. I believe this is an American designed phone. I, I'm not. I'm just, I haven't looked into the deeply. I think it's. I think it's still Chinese manufactured, but I believe it's American designed. Yep. Um, it's got two rear meg, two rear um, cameras, a 50 meg and a 12 meg, and a 50 meg front camera. Apparently. Hmm. So. Good for but, selfies. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see. Um, Especially with the name, just like calling it the nothing phone. Like, oh, it's, it's, it's nothing, you know. It's, it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing special. But uh, apparently he's got this, he's got phones, um, des- des- he's got phones designed to how he wants to make them, but he had to get something as a, a base, as a foundation to start with. Hmm. So he just decided, oh, I'll just build this one and and I uh, release this one at least people can buy this one and then see how it goes once he actually starts making some money <laughs> <laughs> go all Steve Jobs and make his own thing take over that's it uh, shall we do some news then yes we shall that's good Nbank Co has laid out fresh proposal to scrap separate bandwidth charges and introduce flat race pricing across all fixed line and wireless plans by July 2026. The company is also now proposing flat rate price reductions on plans 100 meg and above, with the biggest price cuts aimed at its up to gigabit residential tier. A clear nod to its intention to get as many customers with gigabit capable infrastructure using it to the fullest extent. In addition, NBN Co said it will place restrictions on its ability to recover sunk costs from its retail prices, cap its prices for a period on average at CPI and enshrine service quality standards in the SAU instead of leaving them to the wholesale broadband agreement process. How the proposed changes will be received by retailers, the ACCC and the government remains to be seen. Though the government has flagged changes with a statement of expectations concerning NBN Co and retailers are optimistic that NBN Co will be better positioned to pursue a more radical change agenda, it's clear NBN Co is still somewhat constrained. NBN Co's mandate to oper- operate on a standalone commercial basis as a government business enterprise has not changed, they said. It may re- remains imperative that the commitments NBN Co makes to the SAU and the WBA are set so as to support a sustainable NBN, including to provide NBN Co with the opportunity to continue to efficiently invest in the network consistent with government policy and the expectations of RSPs and end users and to achieve and maintain a standalone investment grade credit rating. NBN Co said the changes proposed today include a three-year phase-out of the connectivity virtual circuit CVC bandwidth charges altogether do not come without a cost. That should be interesting because everyone's been complaining about the CVC. Yeah. They, they want to phase it out within three years. But, I mean, what? why? Like, why suddenly now... Different government, <laughs> like, but it's not government. The NBN's privately run enterprise. Yeah, <laughs> has nothing to do with the government. The government has no, no control over it. Has no say in it. Doesn't have any of their mates working there. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> <every, laughs> sorry. It, it's the, in many respects, it's exactly the same as every other government, non-government industry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and they're all run by Scott Morrison, apparently. <laughs> I'm safe from Scott Morrison's job takeover. Yeah, same here. <laughs> he wouldn't know what to do with my job. Uh, he, he couldn't do my job. No. 
He's not stupid enough. Um, <laughs> the, I am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, look, I don't know. Um, if the prices come down and the speeds go up, it should be good. Well, yeah, but then the the question begs to differ. Why? The, what? You know, what's changed in the last six months? And they said, no, we're not going to reduce CBC at all. CBC, and we're not going to cut costs, and we're going to actually think about implementing a higher rate. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, suddenly they've done this massive backflip. Yeah. Um. So what's changed? Why have they what? What's happened? It'd be interesting to know. You know, because... Like, I wonder if we'll ever get faster upload speeds because there's still a bunch of people complaining, yeah, I can get gigabit down, but still 50 is the... Ma well, 40 is the maximum up, I think, for most people. Yeah, Why I can't we get something quite... more asymmetrical? Oh, they've loved it. They've loved having synchronous data. I mean, even back when we had cable. When I had Optus Cable back in 2000 and what four five yep. um that was 100 meg down and two meg up yeah so nothing's changed like it's because you're gonna run a whole office from it on the cheap yeah. that's right right yeah but but they say that and then they go oh look we've got business solutions you can have isdn oh yeah what's isdn well isdn gives you a gigabit down yeah but how much up oh you can have 40 meg up <laughs> but hang on <laughs> why would i pay you know, 10 times the price for exactly the same thing that's available for my house. Yeah. I don't know. Um, there's no reason for it. It's no. pure, look, their argument is it's going to stop people, uh, it's stops people running service from the house and it stops people streaming videos to others. Um, you know, to like, well, to multiple locations at once. Except um, if you uh, have a Twitch account, or a YouTube yeah. account, or a Facebook account, or <laughs> yeah, it it also stops businesses from you know, like even at work, like we're on a business plan and we only get, uh, I think the quickest I've ever seen is like thirty two or something. Yeah, um, and that's supposed to be a business plan. It's like well. Technically, if I have my NAS at work backing up to my NAS at home, which is what I do, they both they bounce off backups off each other. Yep. Um, I can't do anything else because it's taken Saturates all my bandwidth. It. Yeah. You know? Well, I knew a guy in Melbourne who's a musician and they have to record all their audio in raw format, so it's terabytes yeah. Yeah. that he has to upload from either his home to his office or the studio back to home to do some work when he's there, or if it's going to a music website where he mixes it with other instruments from that other people have played and stuff like that. And he just can't do it. If he starts uploading it, it might be done in a month. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, and, and it's not like it's a technical problem. It's, it's, pure, no. it's purely just litigated that way. I know there's a... Um, uh, one of the YouTubers I watch, he's in Canada. Yep. And they have a similar thing. Like, he um, actually... Per he went to the States and purchased Starlink yep. from a friend's address in the States. And then when it got delivered, he took it home to Canada and used it there. <laughs> because the speed he could get, um, as opposed to... He had a commercial... Like, he can't even use his... He can't upload his videos from home. He needs to wait till his... He edits them at home, and then he puts them on an SD, on a thumb drive. Yeah. And when his wife goes to work, she actually takes it to work with her, and she uploads it to YouTube for him. Because he can't do it. He doesn't have the bandwidth. Yeah. But even their commercial premises in the middle of... They're in Ontario, so, it, like, it's the, you know, the capital... <laughs> Canada's the biggest city in Canada. Um, they can't even... Like, I think they get... They're on the fastest commercially available plan. I think it's something like 100 down and 20 up. It's like what we... It's the same as ours, basically. Yeah. They said now that they've got Starlink, like, it's great. He's... he's they live rural. They live out, out in the sticks. He said it works really well out there. Like, he gets, you know, like... I can't remember what speeds were, but something like... I want to say it's gigabit. Yeah. Synchronous gigabit or something, but... 
it, it's stupid fast anyway. <laughs> so like it's just, everything he needs, <laughs> and it's cheaper than what he was paying for his local provider. Yeah, you know, and you got monopolies like that over there. Yeah, well, yeah, you've got a choice: us or no internet. What what would you like? And effectively here, it's not a lot different. I mean, yeah, okay, we've got multiple providers, but we still only have, you can have NBN or you can have NBN. If you can't get the NBN, you can have 5G that won't be 5G. And if you're really unlucky, you can have satellite. Yeah. <laughs> Fixed wireless. That's what you want. Yeah. yeah you, you, you want the one where they use a the satellite for the downloads and the really delayed 3G for the uploads. That, yeah. That's the perfect that's compliment. Because <laughs> two-way satellite, you know, is just too expensive Actually, two-way satellite's absolutely horrendous, honestly. <laughs> they try and avoid it. They try not to do two-way satellite if they can get around. Yeah. Because um, it's... Even with the new satellites... I don't know, see... Once again, it just proves it's a bad infrastructure call because Starlink's pings are in the few milliseconds. Yeah. It, it's no different than most hardline connections. Yet... Um, what's the big... I can't think of the the big satellite is but the one Australia uses for their their NBN yep. you can be up in literally several seconds of of ping time so I mean yeah they're obviously over overselling the satellite um, availability yep. but it also must be the actual data being sent must be on a different frequency it must be a lot quicker the Starlink must be on a faster frequency you know because it's your ping is not really affected by... I mean, it can be affected by equipment load to a point, but generally if the service is overserved, your speed will suffer, but you can still usually have pretty good ping. So yeah. they must just be using a physically slower communication standard. Somehow, yeah. So, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. So basically, the N-band's either going to get cheaper... Or it's not, and that depends on what the government tells the independently non-government-owned company they can do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> right. Now that we've cleared that up... What? <laughs> speaking of internet... Uh, confused cyber criminals have hacked a water company in a bizarre case of mistaken identity. Because... <laughs> huh? <laughs> A company which provides 1.6 million people with drinking water says it's been targeted by cyber criminals who appear to have mistakenly believed they've tapped into a different water supplier. A water company that supplies drinking water to over 1.6 people in the UK says it's been hit by a cyber attack, but the criminal gang involved appears to have claimed to have breached a different water utilities firm. <laughs> Southern Staffordshire Water says it's been the target of criminal cyber attack, which has caused disruption to its corporate IT network, but hasn't affected the company's ability to provide safe drinking water. This is thanks to the robust systems and controls, blah, 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 because that's what they all say. Yep. Uh, Southern Stones for Water hasn't divulged the nature of the cyber attack, but the re reveal has been targeted by criminal attackers shortly after the Klopp ransomware gang uh, claimed to have another water company, Thames Water, who say the reports say they've been breached in a cyber hoax. <coughs> We're aware of reports in the media that Thames Water is facing a cyber attack. We want to reassure you that this is not the case. As providers of an essential service, we take security of our networks, blah, 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 blah. The same spiel that everybody else says. Yep. In a statement posted to its leak site, Klopp claimed that it spent months in the company system. And if that's the case, it's unclear why the ransomware gang thought it was the network of Thames Water if it had actually breached the network of Southern Staffordshire Water. <laughs> Two separate companies that provide water to different parts of the UK. Nobody <coughs> said they were smart. Um, so Klopp still claims that they are infecting Thames Water. Thames is like, nah, not happening. <laughs> and Southern Staffordshire is like, no, guys, it's us that's being attacked. Yeah. And Klopp's like, no, it's not. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a whole chain of stuff here that, like, th then Klopp claims to have access to the network. The gang says it's not encrypted. It claiming we do not attack criminal, we do not attack critical infrastructure, despite that they've claimed to have stolen more than five terabytes of unencrypted data 
to extort a ransom payment in exchange for not releasing it. <laughs> or maybe you could read through it and find out whose water system you're That's taking right. from. How hard could it be? <laughs> so here's the funny thing. They're going to claim ransom demand, right? But they still reckon that they've taken over Thames, even though Southern Surface just says it's us. So when they release the ransom report, against Tame saying give us everything or we're going to release the data they're going to go knock yourself out <laughs> <laughs> okay then if you must I think we can't possibly stop you <laughs> we double dare you to do it in fact so like uh, yeah um it, it's yeah I don't really understand like they, I mean, they're clearly on the ball because last year, ma majority of members of the Klopp ransomware gang were by, were arrested by a sting in the Ukrainian police arrest. Um, so, given everything that was happening in Ukraine, actually, it wasn't last year. When was that? Hang on, let me just double check. And what's Sting doing over in the Ukraine anyway? Uh, so it was that was actually started this year so in amongst everything else that was going on in the ukraine apparently the start of this year they arrested all the suspects in 20 raids wow um across kiev and other towns seizing computers technology and cars roughly worth one hundred eighty five thousand dollars. so crime does pay in amongst everything else that was going on they had time to do that <laughs> uh so yeah so we'll see um i kind of want to follow the story because i kind of want to know what the outcome is going to be did they get caught did they indeed release the documents yep. did they actually figure out now oh, hang on we are in the wrong We're system in the wrong guys <laughs> <laughs> they go, oh shit we can well we'll just leave we don't want you guys we want tames because they're a bigger company <laughs> have all your data back and um we'll just go on <laughs> we're so good we can hack somebody else without even trying <laughs> ends up being like you know scandinavian power grid or something and <laughs> it all goes down <laughs> uh, the internet has shown us that doom can run on everything from a cardboard box to a Roomba and even a single keyboard key but now we can add a john deere tractor to the list security researcher sick codes worked with doom modder skelligant to get the game running on a John Deere tractor display and show off some gameplay at Defcon hacking in Los Angeles, Las Vegas. In the video posted by Sick Codes, you can see how the game plays as a sort of transparent overlay on top of the John Deere user interface. Six Codes says the whole process took months and involved jailbreaking the Linux system used by a John Deere 4240 tractor. This version of Doom has naturally been modified to take place in a cornfield where the player mows down enemies on a tractor. <laughs> But sick codes isn't just jailbreaking tractors to get them to run doom according to a report from wired he also devised and presented a new jailbreak that gave him root access to the tractor system this exploit could potentially help farmers bypass software blocks that protect them from repairing the tractors themselves something john deere has come under fire for in the past as noted by wire sick codes was able to obtain one and a half gigs worth of logs that dealers could use to identify and diagnose problems but he also found a way to gain root access by soldering controllers directly to the tractor's circuit board. Unfortunately, gaining root access isn't all that simple without the right equipment, but Sick Codes told Wired it would be possible to develop a tool based on the vulnerabilities to more easily execute the jailbreak. John Deere's technological grip on its tractors goes beyond barring repairs. Earlier this year, John Deere remotely locked its equipment after Russians stole it from a farm in the Ukraine and has done the same on construction sites in China to comply with the country's financing policies. In response to increasing pressure from politicians, John Deere announced an initiative in March to make a software available to independent repair shops. <laughs> yeah, they launched their initiative any further. Yes. <laughs> That's all they've done. Oh, we're, we're going to make it available for everybody to fix their own track. I mean, not this year, probably not next year. We've got at One least five like, years to pay those debts off. And then after that, we've got the new line of equipment coming out. And that's really pre-programmed, so we can't change that. That's got a service life of 10 years. So maybe after that's done, not after that, we need to reprogram. In the next, oh, 
25 to 80 years. <laughs> Somebody will be able to do something with the rusty broken down tractor. And this is exactly what's happened in the car community, except it started 20 years ago. Um, for every for every barrier that was put up by the manufacturers, aftermarket um, add-ons have, have dealt with it. Yep. Whether it's piggyback connectors, whether it's standalone ECUs, um, you know, if something won't perform the way you want it to perform on your vehicle because the the manufacturer says, oh, we don't want it to do that. But if you then, hack into it, it'll crash and then you won't be covered. Do you want that? Well, that's what they're saying, that, right? Well, Just that's, to... that's what's happening in the States. There's actually been several lawsuits and they're only, hey, now here's the kicker. They're picking on small independent uh, tuning shops. And they're saying, are you selling these devices that let you bypass all these emissions laws and do that and do that and aftermarket ECUs being installed on road cars and blah, blah, blah. We have proof that you are because one of our customers, well, we acted to be one of your customers. We basically put you into a corner and, you know, I'm pretty sure it's called entrapment, but you don't worry about that. Yeah. Um, and so they pick on all these little independent dealers who can't afford legal advice and you know, they're really showing them who's boss by coming down on them. Um, except they make the mistake of doing it to one guy who is a little independent dealer who just happens to be best friends with, you know, people like uh, Holly and... Um, uh, um, I'm having a complete mental blank. And several other aftermarket ECU manufacturers, Motec and a couple others. Yeah. Um, and once they found out what the this is the EPA, who mind you, in the states the EPA isn't even a government organisation; they're a private organisation. Ah. <coughs> so they picked on this guy, and made a couple of phone calls to his mates, who then went to SEMA and stood up on the middle. And for those who don't know, SEMA is the world's largest car show. It's all future technologies. It's all um, vendor very vendor specific so vendors get to show their wares there's there's a lot of show cars and stuff there but it's it's really um the mecca of, of automotive um technology and they went there and they stood up on their center stage and they went so i hear the epa is picking on the little guys well guess what you've now got every major aftermarket component manufacturer in the united states we're going to start a class action lawsuit against the epa wow the EPA went, ah, oh, no, we're not really. Don't piss off the wrong guy, right? <laughs> basically, currently the EPA is actually fighting in the courts to um, basically continue to exist. Yeah. As if this goes, if this hap if this um, class action goes through, they're done. That they, they, that's it. They're finished. But so basically, yeah. So this is happening in the car scene now. So. You've already got farmers pissed off about the conditions that's currently happening with farms being bought out and, and water rights being taken away and um, wholesale right, distribution rights being, being um, uh, interrupted and, and stuff like that. And you've already got farmers on the on the edge of being done. Yeah. And they're telling them they can't they can't change the fluids in their John Deere without a $10,000 service to go with it because they said so? Yeah. And how well do you think that's going to go down? And by the way, John Deere has lost 85% of its sales in the last 18 months. And you wonder. And they can't figure out why. <laughs> I don't understand why everybody... But everybody loves us. They're, they're great. We're, we're, we're America's number one farming implements. Well, no, not now you're not. Where? You were, and then you screwed over your customers. Being a bully. <laughs> but what's interesting about this Doom one, um, the way they implement it, it, if you watch the video, it's actually cool because it is a, it's a transparent overlay because the way the uh, that entire uh, control center works, it's all transparent windows overlaid over transparent windows. It's actually not a solid window anywhere, so yeah. it's kind of weird. <laughs> um, but it does. They're right. Like, it... it even if it does involve hardware modification, people will pay a thousand bucks for somebody to get there and modify their. You know, you send them an ECU, and they use modify it to send it back to them. You know, they'll pay a thousand bucks for that because 
What that means is now when they want to change the filters on the tractor, they can just go and change the filters on the tractor. Yeah. When they you know, need to change the batteries, they don't need to reprogram it to tell it's got a new battery. They just change the battery. Yeah. Or they'll go one step further and go, you send us, you know, send us your old SU, we'll use it for parts, and you have a brand new one that's completely reprogrammed and it's completely independent and nothing to do with John Deere at all. And it turns off all their tracking software and all their remote communication so they can't ever touch it again. Sounds good. Bargain. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'll be in that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't affect the GPS and doesn't affect the location services. So your tractor can still do the proper yep. row, straight rows and everything's got to do. It just doesn't allow John Deere any access anymore. No. Yeah. Big and Brother's that, not going to be watching anymore. And that's what it's going to come down to. You don't buy a tractor to have somebody tell you what you can and can't do to it. You buy a tractor to work it into the ground for the next 20 years, so then you buy a Ford to buy another one. Yeah. You know? Um, I mean... People, people complain about Tesla and like, oh, they've got bad practices and they lock people out and they do this and that. Yeah, but at the end of the day, one, it's, they're a Tesla and they're still kind of a virgin... Like, they're a... Not really virgin technology. They're, they're modified technology every time. Almost every Tesla that comes off the production line is different to the one before it in some in some way. Um, it's it's happening that fast. And when you buy the Tesla, the software is really what makes a Tesla a Tesla. Anybody could stamp out the bodies and put a motor in there. Like that's not mm. not what makes it special. What makes it special is the software. So you're effectively buying software that has a car wrapped around it. Yep. Um, and you, but. With a Tesla, you're basically buying the car and the software is leased, much like it is with your phone. You buy a phone, you're not buying the software, you don't own that piece of software. You own the phone, and then if the manufacturer wishes to update the software, they do that. Um, so, but when you buy a vehicle, you know, uh, not not a Tesla, like it's not like this thing auto, you know, you know has 47, well, actually, it probably does have just as many cameras as a Tesla. Now. <laughs> no, they do have a lot of cameras on them, but that a Tesla's on the road, it has to perform properly. If there's something wrong with one of its functions that needs to disable that service or be able to fix that service so that it doesn't run people over and kill people. Matters a bit less if you no. run over your pig. Yeah, and at, at, at 12 mile an hour, you know, it's not it's not such a huge deal in a tractor if something's not 100%. So, yeah. um, you know, I think, I think this is a... Uh, a, a wake up call to to not only John Deere but to a lot of these people who are doing closed loop servicing now. Yeah. Dealer dealer only servicing uh, that can't be a thing. Um. It can it it's been tried and failed multiple times. It it will never work because, uh, especially farmers who are, like I've heard of stories of farmers that have been told they need to bring their equipment in because the dealership's too busy and doesn't have time to send somebody out. Yeah, it's not like you can just drive your broken down tractor, <laughs> your broken tractor into the dealership. Like it doesn't work that way. I've got a combine harvester that takes up six lanes on the freeway. How am I going to get it to your shop? Yeah. Oh, why didn't you take the comb off? Well, that's why I bought it in because the solid <laughs> for the comb won't release and the comb's stuck. Yeah. Yeah, so. <clears throat> but I, I do love the uh, the modded Doom they had on there. It's quite funny. <laughs> you watch the video of it. There's somebody who plays it um, on a normal screen so you can actually see what it is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's actually really well done. It kind yeah, of reminds me. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite funny. So. Sticking on the hackers front, because apparently most of my story is about hackers tonight. Yeah. Hackers are finding ways around multi-factor authentication. So, MFA or multi-factor authentication or, or 2FA, which is two-factor authentication. The bane of most people's existence in Especially all Especially Mr. T. I uh, hate it. <laughs> um, but not to me. I mean, most people in general are more inconvenienced by it than it solves. Um, so now with this MFA, which is multi-factor and some are using this now, which is three or more certifications to sign in because two is not annoying enough. Yep. <coughs> so they can do things like verification via SMS, uh, or email, um, 
both of which can be spoofed, so it's not exactly hard. If you've already got access to somebody's account, you know what their mobile number is going to be, so you can piggyback off their calls. And yep. if you've already got access to their account, chance say you've already got their email. Um, so really, you know, they're talking about MFA. This article um, goes on talking about how. Uh, what am I trying to say? Basically, it says the more secure you try to make a protocol or a system or an application, or in the case of John Deere, you try to lock down your own firmware, the more secure you insist on making it and the harder you insist on making the average person work for that security, the l more vulnerable they become because they're more likely to write down passwords and access codes and security numbers and... Um, and they're less likely to be wary of like a phishing attack yep. is relatively hard well used to be relatively easy to spot because i've done so badly but now because you've got to log into something three times and not pay any attention to what you're doing you just enter the names and the numbers and the passwords and you use the doodads yeah you're not paying attention to what you're doing it, it could be a completely fake screen but if it remotely resembles the screen that was there 20 minutes ago well you just put the details in yep <coughs> so all the this race race to be secure and, and all that is actually backfiring. Um, in the last year, over 10,000 organizations have been targeted in simple, basic um, key logging attacks. Yep. You know, like, not even hard. It, it's literally um, a, 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 basically a, a screen capture, pro, a, a key logging program. So when you log into say your bank where you need to put in your bank account or your account number and then you put in your pin number and then you put in your account password and then you put in you know and then the the dumb part of 2FA is half the time you know it's a security question but you only have three security questions yeah so you've only got to play this game for you know for three or four logins and you've got all the information you need <coughs> and you have access to it um so yeah, it, it's it's actually, and then uh, yeah, on the ones that you know send messages messages to your to your phone or to your email address, well, you know they're not harder to get into these days. Uh, and they've also discovered there's a lot of legitimate uh, password management. Um, well, they're, they're calling them asset management or something now. They're not just password management because they manage like your passwords, but they manage, you know, your multiple choice answers for the questions and because they don't recommend you use the actual real answers because they can be socially engineered. Yeah. So, you know, your favorite color is brown. Well, it's going to pop up on your Facebook feed at some point and somebody's going to write that down. You know, so it's recommended that you make up answers to questions regardless so there's a lot of programs now that are keeping that information they keep your you know all sorts of different login information and those are being breached now as well so because people have okay you might have a unique password for every website but your three questions you use the same three questions no matter what website you're on because you don't want to remember 700 answers that's right yeah so now we've got a new problem where okay we've got unique passwords but now we've got the same three three words being typed a hundred times <laughs> a day so we're, we're not solving the problem we're simply moving moving it from what was a complicated password to now three simple words yeah so how does it solve the problem it's just actually made it easier for this to now be a uh you know, so socially engineered and, and keylogged because you haven't even got to try and decipher. You know, most of them, when they ask you the three questions or the two questions, they don't. That's plain text. That's clear text. That's not even encrypted keystrokes. Yeah. <coughs> so any screen logging software can grab that. At least passwords are quite. Although I've noticed now, just about every password field has the uncheck option to make it clear text anyway. <laughs> Which I always do because I'm stuffed if I can type it in correctly. Yeah. First go correctly anyway. <laughs> Even when I know what it is, I still get it wrong. So, 
You've only got now. It's literally to the point. You've just got um, someone standing over your shoulder watching you do it, and you don't even notice because you're too busy trying to get the questions right. Just make it too complicated and annoying for the person who wants to use his own account. Yeah, I, 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 nothing about the way any of this is being done makes sense. And the more they try to enforce it, the worse it is. Yeah, you know, like now with zero because zero has got so pedantic on their two FA. <coughs> to the point that if I log in and I've got a tab open in my browser and I open a new tab, I've already got zero open in one tab, and I open a new tab and log in from that tab, it asks me to log back in again. No. Not even a new window or a new session. Yep. It's in that tab, new tab, no, you've got to log back in. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I log back to the other tab, it's logged me out because I've opened it in another tab. Because heaven forbid I want to have two different tabs with two different bits of information in front of me. Just one tab for you, son. Ah, so now I've got the auto refresh program loaded in. Uh, I've got uh, the dashboard for zero thumbnailed or pinned or whatever you want to call it to the bar. Yep. And then you can add, I think you put it in minimized mode. So you just end up with this little tiny tab that's really hard to accidentally click on. And then that whole window is minimized and stuck on the second screen in the bottom corner out of the way. So I can't accidentally close that window. Yep. And as long as I leave that open and an auto-refreshing every 10 minutes, I never have to log in again. <laughs> it shouldn't have to be that annoying though, should it? <laughs> oh, it shouldn't. But the And now we just, I got notification now that um, uh, PowerShop is going to start doing that uh. with their, for their login. And... Um, Aussie Broadband is going to do 2FA now too. Yeah, I got a message about that this week. Like, seriously? <laughs> they make me change... Oh, that's enough to make me change providers. <laughs> if you enforce... Give me the option. Yes, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. You, you want somebody to use it, you give them the option to use it. Yes. Don't make me use it. Yes. That's what shits me, you know. Um, I'm happy to have as an option. I can do, you know, option in or out. That's fine. But when you say we're only going to allow this from now on, it's like, yeah, well, I'm going to find somebody else. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out a Janet Jackson song had the power to crash some laptops back during the Windows XP area. Now, it's not that one that she did with Justin Timberlake that was on it, TV uh, and had uh, a wardrobe malfunction. That was, that was Windows 7 crashing. <laughs> Microsoft software engineer Raymond Chen recounted the incident in a blog post on Wednesday saying he heard the story from a colleague in Windows XP product support. According to the blog post, Jackson's 1989 hit song Rhythm Nation could disrupt a model 5400 RPM laptop hard drive that was used across various notebooks. Microsoft learned of the problem when a laptop manufacturer told the company's window team about the mysterious flaw. Initially, the company thought it had something to do with the Rhythm Nation music video playing over the laptops, but what made the issue even stranger was how the Rhythm Nation music video would also crash Windows laptops belonging to the manufacturer's competitors. And then they discovered something extremely weird. Playing the music video on one laptop caused the laptop sitting nearby to crash, even though the other laptop wasn't even playing the video. Resonance frequencies. They discovered discovery led Microsoft to determine the problem was with laptop hard drives and how the natural resonant frequency in them. This is a frequency which an object will naturally vibrate when exposed to a certain external force. For example, glass can vibrate and even shatter when a sound wave bombards it with the glass's natural frequency at high enough amplitude. This song, Rhythm Nation, contained a frequency that matches the natural resonant frequency of the hard drive that these laptops were using, he said in a video. As a result, playing the song would crash the hard drive's moving disk, cause the hard drive's moving disk to vibrate too much, resulting in a crash. To address the problem, Ten said the laptop manufacturer added a custom filter in the device's audio system that would remove the resonant frequency during any audio playback. And I'm sure they put in a digital version of Do Not Remove sticker on that audio <laughs> filter, he wrote, while adding, though I'm worried that in many years since of the workaround has added, nobody remembers why it's there. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, That'd I be mean, a weird one to troubleshoot. Yeah. It would have been interesting. I mean, they would have had probably the activity logs up and somebody would have gone, why is that hard drive spinning at 2700, then 5400, then 2700? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so re- um, resonant frequencies can cause a lot of damage in really weird ways. Um, you can get... I used to have that with army people walking in step across bridges and the whole bridge would collapse. Yeah. Well, they had to, what they call break step. So they had to, um, they all had to be a quarter step apart. So instead of having a thump, thump, thump all the way across, which caused the resonant swinging of the bridge or actually generally caused a lateral, a lateral vibration, which basically turned the bridge into one of those big, um, <laughs> the, the, there's a bridge called the Galloping Gertie. Yeah, and it it did that, and then it fell down. But they, yeah. they had that at the end of I think it was um, South Park. Yeah, after the credits, they would have that, that bridge, and then it'd fall down. Yeah, that's gallop, galloping Gertie. Um, but yeah, so they used to what they call break step, so that they'd all take a, a quarter step apart, so that you'd have a rolling rolling load on the bridge rather than a lateral vibration. Yeah, um, Tesla um, nearly nearly. Uh, destroyed his entire workshop while he was playing around with magnet with resonance frequencies. Ah. He took a, I think it was wasn't much. It was a 250 gram weight or something like that, and he was working out pendulum uh, speeds for for varying things. And he had it mounted onto one of his big pillars that went up to the center of his shed. And he found, and he was just changing the speed of this pendulum swing. And it got to one particular speed, and then within a few seconds, the entire shed started swaying. <laughs> That'd be in- scary. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's incredibly powerful. A small amount of inflection can cause a huge amount of, of distortion. Yeah. Um, I've heard of stories like uh, with bass competitions and stuff, not... not generally uh, normal strings of music but with bass competitions i've heard of like buildings being damaged from lateral vibrations that have actually given you know the 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 sound itself okay it might make windows rattle and stuff like that but i've heard of stories of actual entire um auditoriums like literally vibrating in, from resonance of of competitions yeah um so to have, I mean, it'd be really interesting to see what their frequency is, and obviously it wouldn't be an issue now anyway because I don't even think the cheapest of hard drives, I don't think, are 5,400 RPM anymore. No. But uh, it'd be cool to see somebody actually do a demo on that, and I'd be curious to know whether it was the resonance frequencies of the heads against the platters or whether it was enough to actually disrupt the spinning the spinning on the, on the platters themselves. Someone's That's, done it on YouTube, surely, right? Uh, I haven't looked, but you'd have to think so, we'll surely. To into that. But to find what that actual frequency would be, because you'd have to know what the frequency in that song. Well, they didn't. They said yes, there was something in that song, but they didn't tell what the actual frequency in that song was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you'd have to dissect the song and see what's in there that could actually do it. But uh, it almost for that to happen, that would it, it has to be an exact hertz frequency so it would have almost like it was they they discovered that on and deliberately made it that frequency like for it to be to that exact hurt cycle required like it to be accidental <laughs> pretty tall order <laughs> so Jimmy jackson's doing a ddos yeah exactly the music <laughs> it's uh, a mad yeah. hacker that one i mean it would be interesting um, and it doesn't surprise me that it would affect the lap. It would affect if he played it, like if a DJ played it. At, um, or a, you could you imagine being an old like retro computer expo or something, and somebody plays it over the stereo, like <laughs> simultaneous crash of everything in the in the auditorium. And uh, all the other people demoing their new laptops, going, "I don't know, it was working fine in the shop before we brought it out." <laughs> It does make me think, though, the amount of times that I've been... I remember doing a lot of um, uh, security camera and surveillance system and stuff. I did a lot of demonstrations at Melbourne University for a while there. Yep. Um, and we had... A, a, the, at one point, half of the uni went down. Network went down. And everyone was chasing everything. It turned out it was a bad fluoro was putting off EMF, which was enough to disrupt uh, the network. But... Yep. We had a lot, often had, we were in the, 
uh, one of the lecture halls. We we're basically next door to the physics and science departments. And we would get random crashes in the middle of presentations and we could bench test these systems at, at the workshop all day and they'd, they'd run for months at a time without crashing. And we'd take them to these auditoriums and they, they could run for 10 minutes and crash or they could run all day and not have a problem. You just never knew. Yeah. And looking back and knowing what I know now, back then, I wonder how many times they were conducting some just standard, you know, nothing special, but some standard experiments involving magnets or involving resonance or involving something next door that was actually interfering with our equipment. Probably Steve Wozniak sitting in the audience with his little blue box going click, click, <laughs> click, click, lol, lol, lol. Uh, I didn't need him. My boss was bad enough at doing that. Oh, what's, you know, oh we're out of lead. I'll unplug this lead. We don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was good at that. But, uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. It does make you think, too, like, it's not so much of an issue now because spinning media isn't as common as it was, but... Mm. You know, how many times, um, you know, media centers and stuff like that in the early days. TiVos. Because remember, yeah, well, remember when Foxtel first came out and TiVo and um, even HCP, HDM, HTM, what was that? Microsoft Home Theater PC. When they first came out, they actually were relatively prone to crashing. So I wonder how much of that is related to that exact problem. Maybe not Could that be. specific song, but Similar. having, you know, playing a, YouTube, playing a bunch of YouTube videos at a party, next thing you know, your, your th home theatre crashes. Yeah. You know, I wonder, you go, oh, it's just, you know, it's just being overworked or whatever, you put it down to that. But I wonder how many times that was actually a direct result of the particular song you are playing. Could be, yeah, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> We shall never know what lies beyond the door. The twilight it's zone. It's a scary door. <laughs> Stay away from that trap door. Wait, that's <laughs> different. <laughs> um, so for the Linux people out there, why are Flatpak... Okay, so Flatpak and Snap. And I guess technically if you're running Pop, then it would be the Pop store as well. Why are they so... What are they and why are they so important to Linux? Um, so... In the early days, and, and not the early, up until not that long ago, Linux uh, always received a bad rap for just being difficult to use and difficult to install software and difficult to find software. and Dependency you, hell. Yeah, basically. And you put one package on and you go down the rabbit hole of packages. and Yeah. And it, honestly, it didn't get any better for many, many, many years. <laughs> In fact, I think it got worse there for a while. Um. But those days are gone now. Linux is incredibly easy to use. Um, it offers hundreds of thousands of applications that can be installed using package managers that make the process very simple. Uh, but not every package manager is created equal. So Ubuntu has apps which is functional generally. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really give it much more credit than that, but it, <laughs> but it's a command line. You you apt install something, you do an apt update, and it it generally does a pretty good job of figuring out the packages required and installs them. Um, then you've got RHEL based distributions, which is same sort of thing. You go to you go to your terminal, you type in sudo. Well, in that case, it's DNF. Um, install you know Firefox for example. Um, so that all relies on repositories, remoted, remoted. Wow, <laughs> repositories, remotely hosted. There we go. My Yay! brain is confused to separate those two words. And <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, you made that word. You're stuck. You're stuck. Mostly. <laughs> um, so they're, they're pretty good. That you know, but if one of those hosts isn't available or one of the files is updated out of place in the packages, it can screw stuff up. But it's pretty good at it. <clears throat> but so this is where Flatpak and Snap and Pop come in. Um, Pop Store. They're considered universal package managers that are distribution agnostic, meaning that you can use them on pretty much any of the distributions, even if the particular one you're using doesn't come with it as standard. Uh, you can <laughs> ironically use an app to install to get it <laughs> uh, to, to install other things from it. <clears throat> so it has a lot of advantages over the old, old way of doing it. Um, it removes the dependencies issues because when you 
Snap or flat pack, it, it contains everything in that. It's like downloading a Windows executable file. It, it has everything there ready to go. Um, and then it, after the download, it does the install as well. So you don't have to worry about trying to remember where you downloaded it to. And then trying to remember the folder, you just put it in so that you can extract it, so that you can, you know, like an R RPM or a dead package. Does where it go you, into you user bin? It. Does it go into lo <laughs> user local bin? Does it... Does it just go in the wheelie bin? Yeah, good idea. <laughs> um... So the other one is that you can gain access to a lot of proprietary software. So uh, Zoom or Spotify, you can't do it using apps. They're not available that way. But with Snap and Flatpak and Pop, they're actually contained within those applications. So you can literally just install them. And it's actually easier than installing a Windows program because... In Windows, you've got to find the program, go to the website, download it, make sure you've got the 32-bit or 64-bit in the right version for your operating system, and then you download it, and then you go to your downloads directory, and then you've either got to extract it or double-click it to open it to install it. Then with this, it just goes, yep, here you go. You want to put it in this folder? Yep, done, there you go. That's it. Like it, It's it's actually stupid easy. It really is. Um, and then it also, the other advantage is it has... Um, a GUI app so that it can be done. You can still snap, snap and flat pack through the command line, but the best part is, um, like the Pop OS, for example, um, they have a GUI, so you can literally open open it. Then you can search for the program you want. And the cool part is, in the case of the Pop Shop, it has all three. Um, Pop OS has all three. It has the Pop Shop. It has, and I think it has Snap, snap by default, and, and then Flat Pack. Well. Yeah, and then Flatpak you can install from Snap, I think. But you can literally search all three. So you start with the native Pop OS shop. If it's not there, you go to like Snap and look there. And if it's not there, you go to Flatpak and you find it there. So you'll find it mm -hmm. somewhere. You know, in worst case, yes, you can app get it if you want to. And if you're really desperate, you can pull it for an RPM or a dead package. But don't, don't, just <laughs> don't. <laughs> um, so look. Uh, it's not all rosy. There are, if you look within the, the a lot of the forums and stuff, there are a lot of people who still have problems doing it. Um, and it does depend on your system. And there can even be the slightest little thing that's not happy about and it won't work. Like, you know, having a second hard drive installed and trying to put <laughs> Steam programs on it. Yep. <sighs> but... Uh, generally the experience is, is much better and it really does make the operating system much more user friendly because even though most distros come with either LibreOffice or OpenOffice now actually most of them will use Libre now I've noticed yeah. more than Open um, you can still put on you know your own favourite programs and you know you can put your GIMP and you can put all that and you don't have to go searching for it you have the one GUI opened up search bar type in what you want done install done run done yeah. Like it's it's so simple it's ridiculous and for me that was i mean they implemented commonly probably mint pop uh mint os was probably well, yeah it was probably the first to really give the gui installation side a push mm -hmm. they had um flat pack i believe i can't remember it was a while ago but that was a default on the installation of mint was a, a gui program manager and it's like wow this is this is amazing like things just work now <laughs> <laughs> and pop os has got a real good implementation and in fact most modern os's now do and if you have tried linux six seven eight years ago and you weren't you were doing everything with app get commands and it was annoying you because frankly that's, it is annoying. I don't care how familiar you are with Linux. It's just annoying. Yeah. Um, it would be really worth going back to it now and seeing the differences it's made. Oh. Linux as a whole, but just simple integrational things like the integrational. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> things like this um, make your quality of, of use just hand over fist better than it was, than it could, it was, you know, like, um, makes a huge difference when you can just go and grab something. You don't have to spend an hour trying to find the exact RPM that works with your particular branch of this particular subset of this particular thing. Yeah. So, um, 
so yeah, so I would I would try definitely. And if if you're uh, if you are using a Linux variant and it does only have um, f- you know Snap or or Flat, then install the other one because you can you you can install both both of them. They they have pros and cons to both. They have different versions of. Uh, we discovered the other day that Pop OS, uh, Pop Shop had one version of a program that obviously the developers of Pop had discovered that that particular version worked better on the OS. Yep. But I think just out of habit, we installed the flat pack or the Snap version and we're having issues with it and then realized that the Pop Shop actually had an older version, but the older version was more compatible with Pop than what the new version through flat pack was. Yeah, and some of them come pre set up with um add ons and things as well. Yeah, um what was it? Uh uh OBS, for example, includes like FM FFmpeg by default. You don't have to go searching for FFmpeg to install after you've installed OBS. And Audacity they include um lame encoder, so you don't have to go hunting around to put the MP three encoder on after you've installed Audacity. So a lot of the time, it can actually be quite beneficial to install it that way because, yeah, yeah everything's just All there. One. So, so yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Aussie Tech Head Show. We can be found at Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Email us, Wheeler Warlock, at aussietechheads.com.au, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.